Thank you very much. You've mentioned Germany a couple of times, and so I, I thought I'd, uh, I'd, I'd bring in the German point of view. I'm Austrian, so I can say uh, things that the Germans don't like to hear, nonetheless. Um, so about the German banking system, yeah? So there is, there's a narrative that I hear all the time. They say, oh, the uh, interest rates are so low, uh, and the margins are so low, and then there's regulation that doesn't allow us to, to uh, take fees, uh, and, and that squeezes our, uh, our income statement. I think that is, there is some truth to that. But um, uh, what is much more striking in, in, in Germany really is that uh, the amount of uh, deleveraging that we have already talked about was just immense. You know? And uh, the IMF has criticized uh, the Germany, Germany's uh, family owned uh, companies recently. This gave rise to almost uh, a rebellion. No? Uh, they don't, didn't like it at all. But uh, those family enterprises have financed the investment they did almost entirely out of returned, of returned uh, profits. Uh, and not uh, going to, to their banks, what they did uh, typically over the history of German capitalism, or, or go to, to, to uh, public markets. So it's re retained earnings. And um, uh, inf uh, investment per se has been low. So the little investment that has taken place was, was financed by uh, retained profits. So that's, that's the, the first thing. The second uh, comment I'd like to make is that we are, we are in, in Germany now in the process of uh, getting serious with the carbon price for the non-ETS uh, segment. So for uh, uh, cars, for transportation, and for buildings. And the uh, idea of a, a CO2 central bank uh, is quite present in the discussion. I'm happy to hear that uh, Gaulier uh, has written about that, but it's also, it's also part of the proposal of my institute, and it's uh, part of uh, something that uh, the PIC Institute, the big climate change think tank in Berlin, has advocated. So there might be something that uh, we should pursue, uh, French and uh, German economists. And the, th the third point um, about the, the Phillips curve. So there's an interesting observation. It's also just a couple of weeks old. There's been a revision in the uh, German national accounts, and that shows that uh, today uh, the share of wage income over GDP is where it was in 1992. So we had actually a relatively uh, strong recovery of the share of wages in, in national income from 2010 to today. So there has been wage growth. At the same time, the capital share has been squeezed, and that you know, so that's maybe another side effect of low interest rates or of low, of low capital costs. So that uh, that uh, in total value added, uh, more could be paid out to to uh, to workers without prices going up because the additional wage cost has been absorbed by by firms. So these are three points. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. And forgive me if I, <laughs> I was alluding to the German citizen. Uh, yeah, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, allow me, please, uh, to speak in French to be uh, very concise and very precise. Uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, no, I'm sorry, because we have no translation. You have no so, translation. So, uh, uh, Unfortunately, there I, is. I, I will try, but I beg your pardon uh, for my broken English. Uh, what? <laughs> no, I, I will. Uh, I, I, I will try in English. If you, you, you are, try English, if I'm you, sorry to say that as a French, I am ashamed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but you can. <laughs> no, there are two or three ideas. Uh, I'm very impressed, but uh, Ellen, ideas of. Uh, Carbon Central uh, Bank. Yesterday uh, we heard uh, about uh, the amount of uh, currencies circulating uh, in, 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 the, in the world. I uh, uh, read uh, some weeks ago about some lo very localized currencies to uh, enhance uh, Circuit court, uh, very short circuits. Uh, do, do you think, I, I, I'm just asking, I have a question, I have not an idea to propose to this uh, distinguished uh, panel, but uh, my question is uh, today, uh, and also we, uh, my opinion is uh, the, the, the trade war, dispute uh, between uh, United States and, uh, uh, and China is uh, uh, 
sous tendu uh, uh, by uh, uh, currency underlined by uh, uh, currency war uh, also is those ideas is today uh, can the world is the world uh, ready for uh, international central bank I, I, I see what you mean I see the question uh, it seems to me that we, we cannot speak of currency wars when, when the renminbi is itself not a convertible currency. So uh, at this stage, the renminbi is not yet in, at the core of uh, the international system. Still, of course, uh, it is a currency which is uh, very, very closely managed. And in a way, it is a currency. But, but Trump, Trump has declared that at least part of the currency war is with the EU. I mean, his view is... And, and you, you can see the, the logic of it. His view is that um, the, the ECB's monetary policy, from the standpoint of the U.S. and international markets, is uh, aimed at keeping the euro weak and keeping the dollar strong. And you know, if you can look at the Big Mac index and see that we have an unprecedented circumstance in which basically every currency in the world, except Norway's krona and the Swiss franc, is substantially undervalued, quote unquote relative to the dollar. So, so there is, I mean, in Trump's mind, there's a currency war, and it's with Europe. Yeah, but, but I, I would totally disagree, of course, both with Trump and with the... Uh, I, realize, uh, I, realize, I realize that, but I'm just saying, if you want to understand the nature yeah. of the conflict, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, it's yeah. important to understand I, what I, the I source is. Of course, of course. So do we have other comments on that, that particular point? Yeah, please. Uh, you want to respond to some of the panelists. So I think uh, let me first check whether we have other questions from the participants that are not speakers. Yes, you have the floor. This is not a question, just comment uh, on the chairman's discussion about the coordinated approach to inflation or deflation. And uh, we had a very good experience in the 1970s where uh, government just requested just uh, you know, lowering the increase in wage and that kind of income policy. But uh, we did the same effort this time on the opposite directions. I mean, the Prime Minister just mentioned many, many times to the private sector to raise wage, but never successful. So uh, there seems to be some kind of uh, asymmetry uh, about just uh, decrease or increase uh, for this kind of policy. And also, one more point. Uh, many people just say because just the interest rate is so low, there's no opportunity for more uh, monetary policy, so why not just uh, fiscal policy? Now, let me just mention the case of Japan. We did have a very strong monetary policy, but because of that, maybe the f f almost full employment, so demand is enough so far in Japan. The problem is just the uh, total factor productivity growth rate is shrinking. So obviously, it just means supply side policy become more important. The problem is supply side policy is very difficult because the government reach is very much limited. So without discussing supply side policy or at least just uh, increasing productivity, especially in the face of the declining real interest rate, uh, we can just get out of this kind of difficulty. Maybe demand stimulation is necessary under circumstances of sudden decrease of the global demand, but still supply side is so important at this moment. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for these remarks. Please. Yes, uh, thank you. We, uh, we have uh, very interesting ideas and suggestions and uh, obviously innovation in finance today. But just I'm wondering about the way we can sell some ideas to politicians we have today and what kind of politician we have, what kind of dialogue we can have. When you talk about inflation, and uh, we understand today that the weakness of the union in different countries and politicians. Uh, this is what we have, the case of GM in the United States. About the, and it's very interesting to observe the way maybe this something is going on, it is new, it is going on. But it is, if we have this, those ideas, and it is, it's for me, it is, I would say, very interesting technical, uh, I would say, proposal or suggestions or adaptation to the situation today, but who will apply those policies? It is politicians. And what is the, the link we have 
and we can have with position today, and if we come back to the crisis of 2008, it was completely different because we have some, I would say, uh, leadership, world leadership we have, and it was said that today we don't have this kind of leadership. It is completely different. It's deluded in between different persons with different, completely opposite uh, ideas. This is what, the, this is a question mark we have. This Thank is you. a pure brainstorming uh, session. Uh, again, I made the rapprochement between the populism and the political pressure, gigantic political pressure on the political sphere. So uh, there are leverage, or there is leverage, uh, to perhaps to go in the direction that uh, uh, wages and salaries could be more dynamic. Uh, and to the uh, Japanese example, I would also say I fully agree that if you want to have the various corporate businesses on board, it has to be done nationally and also within some kind of framework, international framework. And it happens, it is a miracle, that all central banks of the advanced economy have now the same definition of price stability, namely 2%. So it could be an argument at the level of the G7, whatever, at the level of the G20, uh, to, to go further. But again, uh, I dare say that because I said we have the right to do anything, to say anything. Please, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, all the yesterday and today, I suppose the most often heard words were the US-China trade conflicts. If you see that in the, in the context of or in, uh, in relation with uh, underlying hegemonic competition, then I think in this session, very session, finance and economy should be uh, really more worried about the uh, global order and international economic cooperation. Uh, uh, so in that regard, I would like to make uh, uh, observation and comments. Uh, since G20 was mentioned uh, a number of times here, I suppose uh, today uh, some uh, the uh, uh, economist or political economist uh, tend to go as far as to say that the world is in danger of uh, falling into uh, interwar period of uh, what is called the Kinderberger trap. Uh, what that means is the global economy will suffer from not enough uh, public goods, and therefore the world economy will suffer very much from it. Now, the U.S., particularly under the uh, Trump administration now, and according to our discussions all day yesterday and today, even the, the, uh, after Mr. Trump, uh, the similar social political and the uh, geopolitical uh, situation will, will, will last. If that is the case, uh, the U.S. will be unwilling to provide the public co the goods as uh, it did before while China is also incapable to some extent and uh, unwilling, then there is much high likelihood that the world will suffer from much shortage of public goods and uh, may lead to even the Kinderberger trap, if not to see that this uh, trap. Now, so to avoid this trap and avoid this situation, the global community needs closer international cooperation. Who can do that without the uh, hegemonic uh, the, uh, leader? So that in that connection, I suppose G20 can be uh, considered because that is a legitimate uh, the forum for international cooperation. And uh, it has a track record. 
as John, uh, we worked very closely, in fact, uh, throughout the G20 endeavors from the very beginning of the G20 endeavor in Washington, D.C. When G20 was created, of course, there was shared the sense of let's not waste crisis. And uh, Chancellor Merkel actually first uh, said exactly in that terms. And uh, with, with, with that, the uh, shared sense, uh, G20 achieved much. It's a re record of, uh, of uh, saving the world, falling into a great depression-like uh, situation, and it helped make the global economy only suffer what you call great recession. And then G20, in fact, the last G20 meeting, I personally was very, very disappointed, and uh, G20 could have done much more. And John knows very well, it, when it was designed, it was supposed to be ev the uh, process, not event, not photo-taking event, coming up with just, you know, rhetorics, but should, should have been the uh, uh, continuous process which really the world needs at this very moment and the uh, coming years. So uh, what, I, what I would like to uh, say is that somehow we have to resuscitate or re the, uh, revitalize the process. I suppose if U.S. is not willing and China is uh, incapable, then I suppose like-minded countries, particularly middle powers, I think they, you know, they can do something about it. And the next chair country, I understand, is uh, the, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, and followed by the Italy. I think uh, they can do something and the revital so that we can uh, Thank you. save Thank the uh, Thank uh, you very much. falling into Kinderberg trip. It's important that we are on the record, of course to mention that I guess there is a very large consensus here to say that multilateralism is of the essence more, even more now than before, that you're absolutely right. What we have, the, the best informal grouping that exists for that is the G20. It was substituting to the G7 in the occasion of the crisis, the, the G7 accepted that the baton of the uh, most important and pertinent informal grouping was the G20. You're absolutely right to mention that the G20 has positives and negatives. Uh, on the positive, I would nevertheless mention the fact that the work which is being done in Basel, the work which is being done in the Financial Stability Board, goes through a lot of mechanism through the international financial institutions that are very important in all this mechanism, then to the G20, and this consensus of various rules, regulations, standards are stamped by the G20 even today. So we cannot say that it does not exist or it does not do the job. We, we can say it's not sufficient, you are forget, you're, you're concentrating on the banks, but you are forgetting the non-banks, as has been said by a, a number of us. You, you can say a lot of things, but st it is still there, it still functions, and is, it still produces, in my opinion, uh, value added in the global governance. Where we have a failure, in my opinion, and John might have uh, a sentiment on that, is that on the coordination of macro policies, doesn't work. And uh, uh, the Secretariat is the IMF for this particular part of the G20 franchise, and it's true that it is not at all encouraging. And of course, the fact that uh, the President of the US himself says, I, the hell with the uh, multilateralism and so forth. Still, he was participating in my memory in the G20, in the G7, and uh, with some kind of uh, perhaps erratic behavior. Uh, he, was ne he was nevertheless physically present and uh, the, uh, the, the US did not withdraw from the 
G20, all the G7. So uh, I don't want to be, to be optimistic because we have a lot of good reasons to be very pessimistic. What I know in advance, and it is ridiculous, when we have the new crisis, then you will see the G20 very active and doing a lot of things with the sword in the back, uh, clearly. And it, it, it was exactly what happened in uh, 08 or 09. Huh? It was exactly that. When you have the sword in the back, you react, and uh, you are doing uh, crisis management more, uh, I would say, uh, in a way which has been, uh, of course, uh, with a lot of defects, but we avoided the, the absolute drama. That being said, I also draw as a provisional conclusion that we have a large consensus to think that there is a probability of materialization of a very grave new crisis. And uh, that, that is, of course, something which is also very important in our meditation. But Daniel, you had asked for the floor. Let me ask you something. So, uh, I, I, I believe that um, the, the economic slowdown will continue. Um, I believe also that uh, we are kicking the can down the road. I mean, we need to be much more um, frank and say we do not know. This is a stark reality. Uh, and this is why there are people who are thinking, look, in the end we'll resort to helicopter money, not only for the sake of uh, raising the inflation rate, which has become an obsession. It's like inflation targeting is how to create inflation. It's not about price stability. <laughs> it's about creating inflation. That depends no, no, if no, you... I'm saying it, no, I'm saying it. I, I, I'm overshooting, but, but now secondly, uh, I think we will avert uh, um, a big crisis next year because uh, sort of desperation, the resumption of QE, it's, it's reality already. Uh, the talk about uh, a new fiscal stimulus, especially where uh, economists can undertake it, where they central banks or reserve currency providing banks and, and, and wherever there is fiscal space. Uh, what I fear, and as you emphasized, President Trichet, is, um, is the liquidity issue, uh, the Keynesian trap. QEs are basically injection of base money, never in history probably. I mean, we replaced quasi money created by commercial banks with we base money. Never in modern history we had so so huge introduction of base money in the systems, and we still fear sudden stops because liquidity can disappear all of a sudden, like water in the sand. And I'm asking myself, if there will be a correction, a massive correction on the stock exchange. Sorry, what what could disappear? Uh, I mean liquidity. Can very easily disappear. I mean, there are companies which, which sit on, on massive amounts of liquidity. They don't. And, 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 and what happened in the repo market in the United States shows. I mean, the fear of not having enough liquidity. So this is an issue. Who can provide liquidity when a, a new crisis strikes? Who? The Fed again, the ECB, the IMF. Can the IMF? Right? That question, it's, it's pretty questionable. And this is why when Mark Carney came with the idea of create. Now, secondly, investment. John, you're right. But there is, as Mervyn King said, uh, radical uncertainty. Companies are not going to make investment, private companies. Even if we uh, come up with uh, a carbon tax. I mean, it's a price, but there are many prices. There are many, no, no, I mean, I, I can. We, we want to change the way we think about it. The future, I, I agree. But I'm talking about radical uncertainty and, and, and the very low propensity to invest. Then it's only, the, only governments. Government can undertake massive public investment. 
Uh, then, then, yeah, I, I'm sorry. And, and we, last, we then, have then, only the, the, seven and minutes from the, 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 the interruption of the meeting. After, so, after, do, after, do you have another idea that you could uh, float? And what I think about Libra, why I think it should be strongly regulated. I think the central banks and regulators are fully entitled to be more than uh, cautious in accepting Libra and other similar assets. Because Facebook and other entities are huge. They can provide services to billions and billions. I take your point, and I expect we did not discuss the cryptocurrencies and all the extraordinary uh, ideas that are floating here and there, and the token, the crypto token, and Libra, and so forth. I know, Hélène, that you have very strong position because everybody heard it. Uh, and uh, I, I think that you, perhaps you could say a word when you are the r rapporteur for our uh, meeting, perhaps uh, you, you, could, you could say a, a word on that because, uh, because I, I, I think that what you, you said publicly and we all heard, heard it, it was very stimulating. And I must say, I share very much the view of Daniel. Uh, that there is something which is very dangerous there. Okay, so we have uh, two more questions. Yes, please. And there's, there's one thing which I don't fully understand. Um, listening to Laurent Fabius um, and Puyane this morning, listening to the conversation that uh, Jeffrey Fried and, and Bertrand introduced today, it looks to me that the pricing of carbon could be a very simple way to introduce rationality in decisions. So if you increase it massively, then things will change. Why don't we do that even before creating a central bank? Uh, <laughs> that's a very good question, but I'm afraid we would spend quite a lot of time on it. The but point of a central bank is precisely to have a target price, and you don't want a price on your spot price. You want a whole path, which is what the central bank could do very beautifully, like with inflation targeting. So good luck with that idea. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> But, but, but a lot of other questions, I guess, because what do you do with the immense coal production of the Chinese? How would we impose the, the price? You have to, to, to have import con, con, carbon import content at the border. This is also something discussed in the document and maybe in also in, in the proposal. I, then it would be very good that you would circulate the reference uh, in order for us to plunge in the meditation. Uh, thank you. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I sat up in my chair when I heard Jeff Frieden talk about uh, sanctions because um, the Trump administration has basically only sanctions and tariffs as foreign policy tools. Then Jeff knocked me off my chair by saying he uh, foresaw the possibility, uh, distinct possibility of 1930s conditions coming in. Jeff, could you elucidate on both points? Okay, well, I had uh, a couple of things in mind. The first is the collapse of cooperation in the 1930s, which was both cause and effect of the rise of mass dissatisfaction with the way that existing elites and existing political institutions and political parties had dealt with the crisis. So we have to understand that you've got a, 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 a bubbling up of discontent on the part of mass publics throughout the world. and. An, in, in an, an inadequate response. And that's, in a way, that's what we think of as happening in the late 20s and early 1930s. It's interesting to note, by the way, and, and I don't mean this to say we are now in the 1930s, although I think there are some indications. I, I, I agree completely with Alain that, that this is a classic Rogoff Reinhardt style debt, debt crisis. Their average is five to seven years for recovery. The Europeans have, you know, in typical European fashion, done it so well that it's taken 10 to 14 years to recover. The credit channel is completely blocked. And, and all of the indications that people have given are, are, go along those lines. But, but to take the metaphor, and it is just a metaphor or analogy, I never know the difference. The, take the analogy a little bit farther, you know, think back to what happened in the 1930s. In the 1930s, one set of countries, one set of governments undertook really decisive action in response to these mass demands and declared a bank holiday, basically in, decreed an industrial policy put five million unemployed to work, um, ran for the first time in American peacetime history massive budget deficits, and took the dollar off gold. All of these major, uh, uh, um, major measures on the part of the Roosevelt administration. And then there's another group of countries that did something very, very similar. 
the Nazis. As Keynes said in 1936 in his introduction to the German edition of, of general theory, the Germans have, he's sorry to say, and he's very apologetic about it, the Germans have done exactly what I would have done in these circumstances. So I guess the point that I'm trying to make is either we, I don't know who we is, I'm an academic, either people who actually are, are likely to take this in a cooperative, um, sort of a progressive, let's call it, direction, and I very much like the ideas that Ellen floated and that, uh, that Bernard floated, Either people take, either political leaders take it in a progressive direction, or it's going to be taken from them by the populists who are not going to give up when they fail. They double down. You know, if, if the Trump administration is unsuccessful in providing what its constituents want, they're not going to declare defeat and say, well, let's go back to the status quo. They're going to say it's all because of the, the bad international bankers and the multilateralists and the Chinese and the Europeans. And if we only raise tariffs another 25 percent, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there really is a, a sense in my mind of a bifurcation, just as there was in the 1930s. You can go in a social democratic direction in 1930, or you can go in a fascist direction. There really was no other choice. And I think at this point, people have to recognize that this is not just another recession, just like it was not just another uh, um, uh, cyclical crisis. There is a fundamental questioning of the very foundation stone of the post-war international economic order. And it's not coming from the developing countries. It's not coming from China. It's not coming from the, the Soviet Union. It's coming from, in some cases, majority populations in the advanced industrial countries, or populations that are willing to stand behind political leaders that are promising results that, that re require essentially undoing the international economic order as we know it. So that's sort of what I would call sort of, I mean, if I want to think about it, a, a call to action. The call to action is, you know, we have these long-term trends that have left many behind. They want answers. And we keep responding to those long-term trends by saying, well, the answer is education. The answer is infrastructure. The answer is a variety of other things. That's not the answer people's want, people want. And I'm not a politician. I'm just an academic. But politicians, what we need is politicians who can provide an, a po politically attractive alternative that takes our countries in a direction that's acceptable to our people. And right now, we don't have that. And I think that the time is very dangerous. Sorry for the we, we, <laughs> we, we, I think, all agree that the time are very dangerous. but. From time to time, I am thinking, the US is the very place where populism is erupting and taking a dominant position. And maybe it will go on and on. What is the current account uh, of the US? Minus 3.5% of, the, so if I'm not misled, of the GDP. So the US already spent much more than it earns and when you look at the monetary policy, she's extremely, it is extremely accommodating, obviously taking into account full employment. When you look at the fiscal policy, it's already extraordinary. So the recipe, if there is a recipe, is of a totally different nature from what was done in the 30s, it seems to me. Because there you had to embark in a very strong I would say, ultra-accommodating fiscal and monetary policy, but, but then it's already done in our case. So, so what's behind? I mean, we have no time. But the, the question is, what do you suggest, sir? You're an academic. You have all rights to suggest anything to the political sphere. And I think Akinari wants the last word. <laughs> Please, well, Akinari. Analogy with the 30s is perhaps irrelevant at this moment simply because you know, in the 30s, the major problem was unemployment in the US, Japan, and uh, Germany. Now, uh, Japan, US, unemployment rate is lowest during true. the past half century. Absolutely true. So the major problem is low wage increase. Mm. So why don't we address uh, policies, you know, directly to that? That's incomes policy as uh, Motoshige suggested. I agree. I and, agree. And it didn't work because it was not structured well enough. I, you know, yeah. for, for those who learn or studied economics in the 70s, we are familiar with TIP, uh, meaning tax-based incomes policy. Sidney Weintraub and Henley Wallach. Of course, Henley was uh, governor of the Federal Reserve Board in those days and who was a regular visitor to, 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 to Basel 
when I was working yeah, there, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so uh, why don't we revisit TIP, uh, tax-based in tax incomes policy? It's, a, it's an idea. This is brainstorming. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. One sentence that I didn't mean to suggest that the conditions were, the economic conditions were similar. The problems are very different. But the fact that we face in some ways a crossroad or a, or a, a fork in the road, I think are, are very similar. And I think that the kinds of ideas that people have been throwing around, whether it's universal basic income or tax-based incomes policy or the, the carbon price, all of these things are things that I, as, academic, as an academic, would encourage politicians to start thinking about and talking about, because if we don't come up with some alternative, I think we are in, in real trouble. I think it's uh, le mot de la fin, if I may. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you all for this very, very fruitful discussion.